Welcome to River Foursquare. We aren't your typical church. We don't just watch a message. We discuss messages in our virtual and in-person communities. If you are able to watch a YouTube video or share a YouTube video, grab some friends, get together wherever you are, and have church. Grow in Jesus and see what he wants to do in your life. If you're part of the local Seattle area, we're having our all-community gathering where all of our community members come together for worship and prayer and communion at Grace Church in Federal Way. Our next one is November 19th. It's a Saturday at 6 p.m., and we'd love to have you come out and join us for that. If you are part of River, thank you also for continuing to give. You can do that by text. 16 to 84321, or you can go to riverforsquare.org and click on the Give tab and come on in and join what God's doing by partnering with your finances as well. Well, let's pray and let's get started. Jesus, we thank you that you're here with every believer in community. You said because wherever two or more are gathered, you're there. Father, we thank you that you're there. Jesus, we thank you that you send your Holy Spirit, as you said you would, to be our teacher. So we ask you to do that very thing. Holy Spirit, teach us. Holy Spirit, instruct us. Holy Spirit, show us what we need to know from Scripture, from your Word, and transform us into who you've called us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. So last, well, we're in this life of David. And last week we talked about is sometimes it, sometimes there's giants. And we specifically talked about the story of David and Goliath from Gath, um, who was a giant. And in our lives, sometimes there's things that seem larger than life. They, they're larger than they should be. Not because they aren't, not because they're small and we blow them up. No, sometimes they're really big. They are giants, absolutely. And there's issues and problems, and we have to know how to, how to deal with this. We have to know how to, to conquer these things. And in that process, some things we learned from last week is we have to know God more than we know the problem. We have to know God more than we know the giant, who he is, what he does, what he's all about. We have to know that more than we know the potential of the problem. Because the problem doesn't love you. The problem doesn't care. God loves you, though, and he does care. So we have to know him more. Also, what we learned, we have to fight with what we have. You guys, you need to go back and watch last week's message. Just stop. Just go, go back. Because you have to fight with what you have. And that's Ephesians chapter 6, right? You have to go through that. You have to, you have to do what Paul says, which is in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might, that God is strong and he wants you strong. The other thing is we learned is believers have to step up. We're going to have to run to the giant. We can't wait for the giant to come to us. We can't wait for the problem, the circumstance to knock on the door and come to our. No, we're going to go kick down the door and deal with the situation, right? We need to step up, face it, and in that process, we're going to wage war when we pray. We're going to do battle when we pray. And when we pray, we kill giants. When we pray, we tackle problems. When we pray, God steps in and does what we can't. And that's what prayer is. We're asking God to do what he said he would do. We're asking him to make our circumstances match his promises or his declared intentions to make them match. Watch last week's message. Just, just go watch last week's message. So here's something for our community groups to discuss because we just don't watch a message. If you're just sitting there right now on YouTube or whatnot, you're watching a message, you need to get in one of these virtual groups because church is not an isolated activity. Church is a group activity. And we're not supposed to seclude ourselves from church because that's what it talks about in Hebrews. It goes, don't neglect the gathering of the believers like some have already have. It goes, Paul said, or the writer of Hebrews, I should say, said this. He goes, don't be that guy. Don't be that guy. So if you're watching this, find a group, go to our website, riverforsquare.org, get in a community. Those of you already in communities, here's the question, back on track. Did you step up to anything this week? Did you tackle a giant? Did you did you go and, and kick in a door and, and kill a giant? Did you wage war in prayer? What all that look like? How is the battle going? Let's talk about that.
So this week, continuing with David again. So David's had some victories. Um, he is, he's been anointed king. He's killed the giant. Uh, he's had some victories. And he, he's, he's getting a reputation for himself. He's had success. Unfortunately, uh, there is an individual who's not happy with David's success. He's not happy with it. And David, in this process, needed a friend. He needed someone to look out for him, to help him. And we, as ourselves, as we need strong relationships in our life to look out one for another, to take care of each other, just like David here in the story. So we're going to pick up here in 1 Samuel chapter 18, 1 through 8. As soon as he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And Saul took him that day and would not let him return to his father's house, talking about David. Then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was on him and gave it to David and his armor and even his sword and his bow and his belt. And David went out and was successful wherever Saul sent him, so that Saul set him over all the men of war. And this was good in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul servants. And as they were coming home, when David returned from striking down the Philistine, the women came out of all the cities of Israel, singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with songs of joy, with musical instruments. And the women said, sang to one another as they celebrated, Saul has struck down his thousands, but David is ten thousands. And Saul was very angry at this, saying displeased him. And he said, they've ascribed to David ten thousands. To me, they have ascribed thousands. And what more can he have but my kingdom? Well, he wasn't much wrong. He wasn't he wasn't wrong. Um, so you can see here, so David's getting this reputation um, that Saul has, King Saul, has put him in charge of a section of the army, men of war, whatever that looked like, right? He had men under his command. Let's put it like that. And looks like he went out and did some battle, came back in, and he's coming into the city with, with Saul, and people are cheering, and they're chanting, you know, for David, and they're chanting for Saul as well. But what they're doing is, Saul's, ah, he's killed thousands, but David, he's killed ten thousands. And this does not go unnoticed. This does not go unnoticed at all. That Saul is seeing David special. Matter of fact, even in the text, it says everything that David put his hand to succeeded. Saul gets this. Now, in the middle of this, David builds a friendship with Jonathan. Now, Jonathan is Saul's son. So there's a strong bond. They are, they are BFFs, if you will. Like they're, they're, they're best friends, right? You know, here's Jonathan, here's David. They're hanging out together every Friday night, right? They're going to the parties together. They're going to war together. They are, they are friends. And there's this dynamic between them, and then there's a dynamic between King Saul and David. Now, let's look more at this, and let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 19 now, first one. And Saul spoke to Jonathan his son and to all his servants that they should kill David. But Jonathan, Saul's son, delighted much in David. And Jonathan told David, Saul, my father, seeks to kill you. Therefore, be on your guard in the morning. Stay in a secret place and hide yourself. And I will go out and stand beside my father in the field where you are. And I will speak to my father about you. And if I learn anything, I will tell you. And Jonathan spoke well of David to his Saul, his father, and said to him, Let not the king sin against his servant David, because he has not sinned against you, and because his deeds have brought good to you. For he took his life in his hands and struck down the Philistine, and the Lord worked a great salvation for all Israel. You saw it and rejoiced. Why then would you sin against innocent blood by killing David without cause? And Saul listened to the voice of Jonathan, and Saul swore, As the Lord lives, he shall not be put to death. So Saul being jealous, and there's all kinds of other influences, probably demonic influences there. There's all kinds of things going on there. Saul speaks, King Saul speaks to Jonathan and the other servants there. He goes, I'm, let's kill David. Let's kill David. Now, Jonathan doesn't immediately pipe up. He doesn't. So they dismiss the meeting. John immediate, Jonathan immediately goes to David. He goes, David, my dad's going to kill you. Literally. And he gives him some instructions on basically how to get out of Dodge, right? How to get out of town, how to stay safe. And then he 
And then Jonathan makes a commitment to David. He goes, David, I'm going to go and I'm going to stop this from happening. And so in that process, he has this conversation with his dad saying, you know, let's not kill David. <laughs> let's not kill David. And so Saul makes a promise, you know, as the Lord lives, I will not put him to death. Now, spoiler alert, Saul breaks that promise. He tries to kill him several more times in this process. But Jonathan stepped up and spared David his life. And it wouldn't be the last time Jonathan stepped up and spared David. See, David needed a friend. David was, he's in this whirlwind. I wish we knew how much time had passed from when uh, was it? the prophet Samuel showed up to this time. Because we don't know. Was it a year? Was it a six months? I don't know, but there's still a whirlwind of activity from being a guy who watched sheep to being a person who was in a palace hanging around with the king, who's now put in charge of, of these men of war, who now a king wants to kill him. This is a whirlwind. This is drama. Remember in, in the first message of the series we talked about is David went this his life encompasses so many different aspects and, and facets of life. And a lot of them were, were dysfunction. Well, this is a pretty good one. This is a pretty good messed up situation because Saul wants David dead. And the person that befriends David is Jonathan, whose dad wants to kill David. Okay, how's this? That's Jerry Springer. That's literally Jerry Springer coming out, and we're, we're, their people are shouting Jerry, right? All the servants are shouting Saul, Saul, right? And they're coming out and do this thing. Now, so if you thought about that, I was thinking about this as um, childhood friends. I remember um, probably my first friends were probably kindergarten, and there was three of them. There was Robbie, Donnie, and there was like a Scott. It started with an S. It's the only S name I can think of. Because I didn't, I've never known a Sam. I can't think of any S names. But so those, those, those were like my friends in kindergarten. I remember my birthday party, Robbie came and got, brought me a present. It was this weird Batman thing. I've never seen another one since. I've actually Googled it just to see because it was, it was weird. <laughs> but anyway, we digress. And I remember he's like, I opened up, you know, opened up the thing. And he's like, I'm like, oh. Uh. He, Instagram goes, watch, watch, well, let me show you. Took it, ran around the backyard, and broke it. That's why we can't have nice things. Okay. Instantly broken. Who are your childhood friends? The earliest childhood friends you can remember. Like the earliest ones. Not like, not like, did you, like the, the first one. Can uh, you think of one? Well, I had a very interesting childhood. So I grew up in like a commune almost. It's awkward. <laughs> um, because my parents were, had house ministry from the 70s. And so we had lots of people that lived with us. So my first friends were adults. Those don't count. <laughs> and um, then there was different kids that came in and out of the house. But honestly, I don't remember what their names are because they didn't live there for really long So they a made a lasting time. impression upon you. Um, I know that... Like, and then I moved schools three times before I was in first grade. So, like, they didn't stick out. My first, like, friend that I remember that, like, became my friend when I started at the newest school, his name was Jimmy G. And Jimmy G was the first kid to talk to me, and he was awesome because he could walk on his hands. And he was a great kid, and we became good friends. I had other friends, but I ended up, I was a tomboy. And so, Jimmy G, shout out to you wherever you are. <laughs> wherever you are. <laughs> Thanks for he being my he, friend. He can't walk on Thanks his hands Thanks for not anymore. making me feel weird as the new kid. So, so there, there's, there's a prime example is when we think about our school friends, right, those early friends, those are friends of convenience. Those are friends of convenience because they were the people around us that they had to be our friends because they were around us. Like they didn't have a choice. I didn't have a choice. Well, we have to be friends. Right? They were friends of convenience. Now, as, as we continue to grow and, and mature and grow up and whatnot, when we get to pretty much college and after high school, so that, say, 19 and above, 18 and above. It doesn't work in high school, but from 19 and above. Our friends become friends with an intentionality because now we have a choice. 
because we're not friends with them. Oh, because we're in the same class every single day. No, no, we're friends because we're not in the same class every day. And now we're choosing to engage in relationships. We're choosing to engage in friendship. There's a purpose to them. And that's how we really build strong friendships when there's an intentionality and a purpose in these relationships. Was it Proverbs 18, 24? says this, a man of many companions may come to ruin, but there's a friend who sticks closer than a brother. The writer there in, in Proverbs is basically saying, he goes, you can have all kinds of casual friendships. He's like, yeah, right? He didn't say, oh, you have casual friendship come to ruin. He goes, no, you may come to ruin. Maybe basically what he's saying is your casual friendships are just casual friendships. But then he points out, and he goes, there's another friend, though, that's family. And they're going to keep you from ruin. They're going to protect you from ruin. That's who Jonathan and David are to each other. They're not the casual friends. They're not the many friends. They're the friends who keep the other from ruin. Obviously, because Jonathan is saving David's life. What kind of friend are we? Right? What kind of, fr- what kind of friend are we? Are we supporting our, other, our, our friends? I should say other people. But are we supporting our friends? Are we being like Jonathan, looking out for those we're in relationship with? Even to our own ruin. Because... Sure, he was, Jonathan was Saul's kid, but still, he's still king. So here's a question for us to discuss in our communities. Do you, or have you, or who is your best friend? The friend that, and it's weird because we really don't use best friends anymore as adults. We really don't use those terms. I know as a guy, we don't, we don't, I don't use these terms. I don't, I don't know what these are. It's more, I, I don't use these terms. But we'll say a good friend. Who are these people in our lives? And what, what are the things we value about that friendship? What are the things that is, is of, of great importance to us in that relationship? Let's talk.
we just came back from talking about in our communities about these qualities of of, of friendship, the 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 things. What, what was the exact question? The things that we value most, the things we value most, and I think one of the the big important characteristics of a friendship is the ability to tell the truth. Proverbs 27, 17 says this, iron sharpens iron and one man sharpens another. Are we a truth teller in our relationships or do we flatter? Right? There's a difference, right? The truth teller is going to tell it how it is. The flatterer is just going to tell you what you want to hear. Not what you need to hear, what you want to hear. Can we speak truth in our relationships? Can we say the things that need to be said that are hard? You know, oftentimes telling the truth can be perceived as confrontive because they're challenging the core of who we are. They're challenging our behavior. They're challenging attitudes. They're confronting, I guess they are confrontive, they're confronting things that maybe are out of whack, things that have got out of hand from us. Now, the key things to be able to tell the truth, because in relationship, we wanted to be truth tellers. The key thing about all that is be in relationship to tell truth. It's amazing. I see all these people who try to tell the truth and they're not in relationship and they're like, oh, they, they have a fight and it becomes this arguing match. I'm like, duh. Because you weren't in relationship with them, yet you're trying to tell the truth. No good will come from that. So the key thing is be in relationship because when you're in relationship with them, they already know how much you care for them and it's not a new thing. It's not a new thing. Telling the truth in the relationship means listening to the Holy Spirit. Because just because something may be tweaked doesn't mean you need to do it now. There's timing involved. Now, in all this, to be able to tell the truth, there's no formula. There's no plan. There's no one, two, three steps. You can't read a book on this, right? But what it is, is being willing to say, I'm going to tell the truth in a relationship that I value truth that I value honesty. Now, that being said is, are we the kind of person who can receive truth? Right? It's not just speaking the truth into everybody else. No, it's receiving truth for ourselves. When truth is shared by a friend to us, do we listen? Or do we fight? Do we fight or do we listen? Proverbs 27, 6. There's going to be a lot of Proverbs today. Proverbs 27, 6 says this. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Profuse are the kisses of an enemy. Basically, the writer is saying, he goes, when you receive a correction from a friend, it's going to help you. When you receive correction from a friend, it's going to be. See, receiving truth or receiving correction isn't necessarily fun. But if we listen to it, take it to Jesus, See where Jesus is, wants to deal with it and process it. Ask him to show us the truth in what is said. It can bring healing then. It can bring transformation. And it's a catalyst for the Holy Spirit to do some work. And I think, too, it's that truth that, that sets you free. I mean, Jesus says this, the truth that sets you free. And sometimes it's not necessarily that you're doing something wrong that people are calling out truth, but they're, they're speaking truth to you that you're not living the type of per life that of the person that God's called you to you're be. You're better than that. You're better than that, that you can do it, that, that it may look hard right now, but you can make it because I know that you're a person who is like this. See, we don't have to just come in, oh, you know, you're doing all these things wrong in our relationships either. We come in with the truth of who God is, of what God's called them to, of the, the mission and the purpose and the gifts and the talents and the things that you see that you love about that person. And as you speak those truths, as you speak the truths that build relationship, then you can bring in all right, and God's been speaking to me about this for you. Have you thought about this? Or they bring a challenge or a problem or something that they're facing. You can go, okay, well, what does God's word say? You speak that truth. And 
as you do that truth, that is where the healing and the building and the relationship and the way that God has led you to walk together, to fulfill each other's purposes with each other and by each other's side, that's when it's going to come. And that's when God shows up. Let's talk about the second one of these. Keys to friendship, being part of those friendships, being part of those strong relationships. Serving one another. Serving one another. Jonathan looked out for David. Jonathan served David. He warned him of danger. My dad is going to kill you. It wasn't just because they took the car out late on Friday night and didn't return it back. No, there was bigger problems than that, right? My dad's going to kill you, David. You better run. Friends serve one another, and they counsel one another. They give a listening ear to one another because there are some times in life we need to get what's in our head. We need to get it out, and that story needs to be shared unfiltered. just needs to be shared with no disclaimer statements. Right? You know what I mean? And that person we share with has to be a safe person. We have to share it with somebody we know who has the best, our best interest in mind. Are we that person for somebody else? Because when someone shares, when somebody just brain dumps, when just dumps on us, that doesn't mean we have to have a response. Doesn't mean we have to re- have a response. It doesn't mean we have to fix anything. It just means we have to be there and let them dump, let them share. And it means sometimes we listen, sometimes we respond. Sometimes we remind them of who God is in that mess they're dealing with. We help them to see this is what God's doing. This is what he's doing here and reminds us who we are in Christ. It's someone, when someone shares all that stuff, it's someone that who prays for us and prays with us and wages war. Remember, once again, brings up God's promises versus the circumstance situation we're going with and say, God, make them match. It's serving one another. Let's do a question here. Let's do a question. So in our communities, what is the, I don't want to, I don't want to say that word. I'm looking for another word. Best. Here, I'll just talk out loud. Um, versus talking not out loud. Anyway. Your head. So what is the best or nicest or most impressive, kind of see where I'm going with this, thing a friend has ever done for you? Supportive. Supportive. There's another word. What is, what is that thing that stands out in your mind that you had somebody you're in a relationship with do for you that blew your socks off? What is that thing? Let's talk about that.
All right, the third thing here. This is very hard for me to title. I struggled, so I made up one. I still don't think the title actually demonstrates or convey, his actual conveys, conveys what truth. has to be done because I struggle with it. But in in our relationships, in those friendships, there's relationship and our future. Relationship in our future. Here, here's what I mean by that. Our relationship, our relationships shape our future. Our relationships shape our future. There's that old phrase, uh, show me your friends and I'll show you your future, right? Show me your friends, I'll show you, show you your future. Actually, scripture talks about that, but we'll get to that in a minute. Are we the kind of friend that helps another friend get where they want to be? Or where God's called them to be, right? Right? Are we that kind of friend who propels them, who pushes them, who encourages them, who drags them? All these, all these apply to get to where they want to be. Are we that kind of kind of person? First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33 says this. Paul talking. He says, Don't be tricked. Bad company cor- ruins good morals. Basically, what Paul is saying here is the people you hang around with shape your future. They shape who you are. So who are you being with? Who are you being with? Because we don't want to be that bad company Paul speaks of. We want to be the good company, right? The the positive of that situation. We want to be that person. The person who propels another forward. A person who encourages their dream. A a person who who builds courage. A person who partners with and helps them accomplish things together. A person who promotes other people. See, Jonathan was supposed to be king. His dad was king. We know that we've read the books, right? We've seen the stories. He was Prince Jonathan? Though scripture doesn't refer to him that, but, but work that, that with would me have been, here. I mean, Saul was the first king of Israel, but all the other kingdoms around them that had kings, they knew the, they routine. Knew the routine, right? They you're, knew the routine. You're the king, your kids get to be after he you. He gets to be the king. So Jonathan was supposed to be king. And somehow everybody knows David's supposed to be king. And it's weird because there's never like a... Well, the Bible doesn't tell us there was ever a moment that every that the word leaked out. Yes, like that the, David's there was like the this guy. grand aha. It just keeps leaking out more and more that everyone's starting to figure it out that David's supposed to be king. But surely Jonathan knows this as well. His dad's been talking about it. He goes, there's only one thing left for David to get is the kingdom. And and eventually, in just a couple chapters, he Saul challenges Jonathan and goes, Jonathan, you're an idiot because that guy's going to take your job. Literally, that's what... Saul says, he goes, you're being dumb. But here's the thing is, David, I'm sorry, Jonathan served David and it didn't matter what job title Jonathan had because the relationship was better. Jonathan didn't allow jealousy to consume him unlike his dad. Unlike his dad. We want to be that person where our friends win we win. Because that's the mindset Jonathan had. He was submitted to God, even though he saw who David was. It didn't matter because we're friends. That's priority in this situation. The friendship mattered to Jonathan. John chapter 15, verse 13 says this. Greater love has no one than this, than someone who lays down his life for his friends. Good relationships matter. Good relationships, they're sacrifice. Reciprocal sacrifice. Power word, reciprocal. Go back to math class. It's reciprocal because we're seeking to serve one another. We're seeking to, we're being the best to pull out the best in somebody else. And we're both partnering with Jesus to grow stronger in our relationships. See, Jesus modeled this. He he modeled this. He spoke truth to his friends. He built them up. He walked through disappointment. And he worked to restore them when they didn't live up to the standard that they wanted to be at, namely Peter. He spent time sharing all that he was with them. So who needs our friendship? 
who can we be that person to who has been a good friend that needs to be honored and thanked? And who do we want to be friends with? Because bad company corrupts good morals. Who do we want to be friends with? Who are the connections we need to have and celebrate and spend more time in to be built and to build? So here's a, actually, you asked this question. Uh, when it comes to friendship, is it easy for you to be a friend and is it easy for you to make friends? And if it's it not, may not be the same thing. It may not be the same thing. And if it's not, then then why is that hard for you? And if it's easy, then what what about that's easier for you? And I know we're gonna get into the introvert extrovert thing, but friendship. I think it's. I think it's, it's, it's not, beyond it's not that. that. It's not that. It's there's something about the ability to open up your heart to someone else. Is that something that you can do? Is that something that you have struggles with? And why?
Our relationships matter. We need a Jonathan. We need a David. We need to be Jonathan. We need to be David. We need strong relationships in this life that we were built to be in communities. That's why we meet in communities and we just don't watch these videos on YouTube. But if you do, great. Be in a community though. We'll figure it out, right? So we're meant to be in relationships and we need to share what is happening in our life and we need to hear what is happening in somebody else's life so we can be built and so we can build. This is how we're meant to be. We're meant to be in relationship and we, we need to share with that friend what the Holy Spirit is doing in us and share with that friend what the Holy Spirit is doing in them and reminding them who they are, reminding them of what God's called them to do and reminding them how God is still a giant killer. That's who we need to be. We need to have strong relationships. We need to be in relationships. We need people. And we need to be Jonathan and have a Jonathan. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today that, and in fact, there are relationships around us, Father, that we may not know their value yet because we haven't invested in them. Help us to invest in the relationships that you want us to. Help us to build up those around us to encourage them, Father, to propel them forward to be where you've called them to be. And in turn, Jesus, put those peoples in our lives that will propel us to be where you called us to be. And we thank you, Father, Lord God, that there are people in our lives right now and we thank you for them. In Jesus' name, amen.